It's time for a wellness revolution. Brought to you by Hotsi Health and Wellness Center. Honest discussion on maintaining health and wellness naturally to enjoy a better quality of life. He's a doctor fighting to let you keep your doctor. Now, Dr. Stephen Hotsi. Welcome to Dr. Hotsi's Wellness Revolution. I'm Stacey Banfield here with Dr. Stephen Hotsi, founder of the Hotsi Health and Wellness Center. We have got such a great show for you today but first if you haven't already done so you know where to download our podcast it is hotzepodcast.com that's h-o-t-z-e podcast.com great show for you today we have dr janet hull on tap and what is she going to talk about she's going to talk about the dangers of artificial sugars and i think a long long time ago we were introduced to artificial sugars as a way to combat natural sugar is something that would be better for us don't know why, because as more and more studies come out, it really isn't the best way to go. And so this is going to be a quite the fascinating show, isn't it, Dr. Hood? It sure is. We're pleased to have with us today Dr. Janet Star Hull, who is a graduate University of Texas and did her undergrad work there, received a master's from A&M. So as she says, she's conflicted. <laughs> Aren't right. you glad A&M and Texas don't play anymore? You don't have to be conflicted. You can cheer for them both. You don't have to cheer against them. So in, in her background, her undergraduate and master's studies was in environmental toxicology. She went on to get a Ph.D. in holistic nutrition from a naturopathic uh, college in Birmingham, Alabama. That would be Clayton College. So she has... Uh, in her academic degree, she has the background of geology, international geography, environmental science, fitness training, nutrition. She's an OSHA, that's the Occupational Safety and Health Act, Certified Environmental Hazardous Waste Emergency Response Specialist. And she's a toxicologist. She also was a firefighter, interestingly enough. I don't know if you did that paid or whether you were a volunteer firefighter. Which was it? It was a volunteer, volunteer firehouse outside of Grapevine, Texas. So Dr. Janet Hall, since the early 1990s, has been on a mission to expose the dangers of the artificial sweeteners, particularly aspartame and sucralose. Aspartame would be the neutral sweet or equal products you see at the restaurants. And sucralose would be the Splenda. That's in the yellow little packages. You've got the blue, you got the pink, and you got the yellow. And these are the art these are artificial sweeteners. Because of a health condition that occurred uh, in her body, uh, adverse health reaction she had, which she believes was caused by aspartame, she began to drill down and study these these artificial sweetener products that are so ubiquitous. They're not just in the packaging bags. They're in, all, they're in our toothpaste. They're in our chewing gum. They're in our soft drinks, packaged foods, cookies, cakes, everywhere. You can't hardly go anywhere where they're not using some for, form of artificial sweeteners, uh, trying to convince the public that this is the way that you can stay healthy and you don't get Diabetes, or if you have diabetes, you can eat this with impunity and not have any health problems. And Dr. Hall, Hall is going to explain to us why this is not the case, why these are dangerous substances. So, Dr. Hall, you've got the floor. Tell us about aspartame and tell us about sucralose, equal, NutraSweet, and Splenda. Well, I really want to thank you for having me on because this issue has been around for decades. And what surprises me is that it hasn't been um, adjudicated. Uh, it's not taken off the market. People still don't know this information. It just goes on and on and on. So I get real encouraged, Dr. Hotze, when this topic continues to stay in the forefront. It continues to be talked about because... I would assume just about everybody would know their toxic dangers, but because they're not properly informed, because it's not mainstream news, um, and because they make so many billions of dollars off of it, it just goes on. But this has been an issue since the 1960s. Let me, and interrupt, the let, me, let, me let me interrupt you for one uh, minute. You made a very sure. good, you made a very good point. You said because there's so much money to be made in these artificial sweeteners. Uh, yeah. that 
they're still on the market. And when you heard Dr. Hull today explain the detrimental uh, and adverse effects that these particularly uh, artificial chemicals, which have a sweet flavor, the adverse effects they have on your entire body, you're going to say, why in the world wouldn't the FDA ban these, keep them from being on the market? And I always like to say, my dad used to tell me, son, if something seems out of the ordinary and inexplicable, when you know another way should have been done and somebody does it completely different than what should have been done, there's always a money trail. And what we have found, you know, in our interaction with the FDA and studying the FDA, the FDA is largely controlled by the pharmaceutical companies and by uh, which, which make our pharmaceutical drugs and, and these companies also make these artificial sweeteners that are, are used. And because they're so incredibly uh, profitable, there's no way that these drug companies are going to let that happen. So they have certain ways. I'm not saying how, and I know how some of it works, and we could talk about that and have a whole program about, about the, uh, the way the pharmaceutical companies influence the uh, FDA, but that's the case, and you're exactly right when you say it's, it has to do with the money. So tell us mm-hmm. the dangers of these various drugs. When did, when did it start? First, how did you get interested in it? What in the world? Why, why did you get interested in, in studying artificial sweeteners and their adverse effects? I guess you could say it was serendipity. Of course, that makes it sound good. But it, now that I can look back at my experience, it was a life-changing experience that hit me personally. And it was serendipitous because what I was able to learn and put together and bring to the public is helping save people's lives. And so, you know, I, I, it, it all turned out in the, in the long run, but I almost died from it. And what back did you in the have? Day, what happened to you? What, what? I was diagnosed with an incurable case of Graves' disease. Well, now, and, explain uh, that to me. Incurable Graves' disease, ladies and gentlemen, is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid where the thyroid gland leaks out high levels of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone as you know, if you've listened to my programs, governs our body's abil- our cells' ability to produce and utilize energy. So if you get too much thyroid in your system, your body is going to overreact. It's going to be hyper. It's going to be hyperreactive. Your, your temperature is going to go up. Your weight's going to go down. You're going to be shaky or jittery, sweating. And it's caused by an autoimmune disease of the, it's really an autoimmune disease. Uh, thyroiditis. Grave is just the name of the doctor that diagnosed it. On the other side, you can also have autoimmune thyroiditis with Hashimoto's disease. And this is much more common to see people with low thyroid conditions than hyperthyroid conditions. Because we've been treating, you know, we've looked at somewhere around 31,000 people for thyroid conditions. And it's just a handful that I've had come in here with hyperthyroid Now, somebody could take too much thyroid and be temporarily hyperthyroid. You know, if you took too much thyroid, and we tell patients as we adjust their dose and get them on a higher dose and move up, if you get shaky, jittery, your heart races, you're on too much thyroid, you're in a hyperthyroid state, but that can be easily corrected uh, using uh, a beta blocker one on one time and then cutting your, cutting your thyroid out and backing up to a previous dose. So many people have autoimmune thyroiditis known as Hashimoto. That's another doctor that... Uh, that uh, developed or or wrote about this symptoms of hypothyroidism and when there's autoimmune antibodies to the thyroid and an individual has low thyroid symptoms and produces low levels of thyroid, he is known as hypothyroid or has Hashimoto's syndrome. On the other hand, Dr. Hull had Graves' disease, which means she had antibodies to the thyroid gland, and, the, and it got the thyroid so inflamed that it began to leach out high levels of thyroid hormone. Now, Dr. Hull, routinely, you can use, that's not an incurable disease. Well, I mean, it's the only way you can cure it is either take antithyroidal dr- drugs like propylthiouracil or methamazole, or you which have. Which they got me on, yeah. Yeah, or you, or you have an ablation of the thyroid. Which did you have? Well, I had neither. Well, they put me on the medication for a very short amount of time. 
um, and then they recommended irradiating my thyroid gland. But I knew enough that I had gained 30 pounds. And I'm like, hyperthyroidism. Now, you're correct. My resting heart rate was at 170 beats a minute. My blood pressure was uh, about to code. Um, I'd lost my hair. I broke out in cystic acne. Uh, the retina in my eyes had holes in them. Uh, skin lesions. I, I mean, I was, it was awful. Did you uh, I didn't realize how horrible I looked. <laughs> did you develop, ex I, did you develop uh, the, the uh, bulging eyes? Yes, yes, I had the bulging eyes. My contact lenses wouldn't wouldn't stay on my eyes anymore. Um, but I had gained thirty pounds, which is odd. So when I asked, the, that's odd. Uh, yes, yes. And so when I asked the doctor, well, wait a minute, why have I gained thirty pounds? I wish you had been my doctor. He said, "Oh, you women always worried about your weight. Don't worry about your weight right now. We'll just fix your thyroid and put you back to normal." So I asked him the question, well, why is all of this happening? None of this was making sense to me because this happened within a year, just one year of drinking Diet Dr. Pepper. I was teaching at the University of North Texas in Denton. And every afternoon when I left the campus to go through Dallas traffic to go back home, I started grabbing a Diet DP. Never used this stuff before, but we're, this is 1991. So back then, we didn't have the internet, so you know you couldn't get on and Google stuff. So I started drinking that Diet Dr. Pepper on the commute home. Uh, I taught aerobics. I was a personal trainer just to stay in shape. Started gaining weight, so I started exercising more. I would run on my days off from teaching aerobics and weight training. Started gaining weight. My health symptoms were getting worse. And uh, finally, after a year, about four o'clock in the morning when my resting heart rate in bed was at 170, I said, okay, something's wrong. Um, so I drove myself to the hospital and checked myself into the emergency room. I didn't, because I am an environmental toxicologist, if there's a toxic spill in the environment, you just don't dig the environment out. You look to see what that, what caused it, what is the toxic chemical, how, how can you remove it safely, and then how can you restore that environment? So I was just in the mode and the train of thinking that this is what you do. So when I asked him what caused it, and he said, well, we don't know, we have no idea, I knew something had caused it. Something triggered it. It didn't fly out of nowhere because I'd always been very healthy, always. So I stayed in the hospital for three days to get my heart rate stabilized. Uh, I was skipping every fifth to sixth beat. How did they, how did they, what did they, they stabilize it with beta blockers or what, Indorol? What did they stabilize it? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, and he sent me home with the threat, warning, that be very cautious because this could kill me. I could die. And I was 36 years old at the time. So uh, I checked myself out of the hospital after three days, and I went home thinking, all right, I'm going to figure out what is going on here. What caused it? So I started looking for it like a good engineer. What did I do differently over that last year? I started backing up month by month, day by day, week by week. The only thing I had done differently was grabbing that Diet DP. And the more weight I had started gaining over, the, over that one year period, the more I did start using more NutraSweet. And all was available at that time was NutraSweet Equal. So I was using more and more diet products not, you know, to address the weight gain. So once I discovered that aspartame, that diet Dr. Pepper, I started digging and doing my research. Back in the early 90s, I was one of the original research scientists that dug out all of the research findings, met all the researchers, met all of the people working on this issue. Uh, we had Senate hearings. There have actually been Senate hearings with Senator Ted Kennedy and Metzenbaum, Orrin Hatch, all of that group back then. And I met Dr. John Olney, whose laboratory research from Washington School of Medicine had proven in the 1970s that aspartame ate holes in the brains of his laboratory animals, lesions, formed lesions. Um, Dr. Dow Edwards from SUNY University has research results that it lowers the IQ of her laboratory pups and caused cleft palates. 
So I gathered all of this research up and I'm like, bingo, I found it and got off of the aspartame. And this, it took me about three months to get all of this together, got off of the aspartame and immediately my thyroid began to restore. I got off my medication, didn't tell my doctor, went in for those weekly blood tests and lo and behold, in six weeks, Dr. Hotze, six weeks, my thyroid returned to normal. Wow. It took a little bit longer for the weight to come off, but the blood pressure stabilized, the heart rate went back down. And keep in mind, I was a fitness instructor, and so, you know, the heart rate, my, I was in good physical condition. So I was able to restore my health in six weeks. When I finally went back to the doctor, after I knew I was stable, I knew I was right, I knew it was the aspartame that did this. I told him what had happened. He was an internal an internist and shared with him what I had discovered, what I had done, the vitamins I began to take. I detoxed and he stood up in that office and he leaned across his desk and his face turned beet red and he goes, you cannot cure Graves disease. You do not know what you're doing. I'm the doctor, you're not, it will come back. You will, you're going to die if you don't do something about this. And that was in 1991. Well, here I am, perfect <laughs> health, and everything's been great ever since. So I compiled all of this information into my book, Sweet Poison. It was very difficult to get that book sold because people were not coming out and standing up against Monsanto, Donald Rumsfeld, um, you know, the gang. Um, but I got it published in 1997 and it's what they call, the book has long legs. It's still going strong. It's sold in Great Britain until they banned it and took it off the shelves. They Tell me it's, why they um, did that. What was their reason for doing that? Uh, they were threatened to be sued because the uh, laws are different over in the UK. And so my publisher was, was afraid she was going to get sued. So they removed it from the shelves. Like they don't, have, they don't have freedom of speech, believe it or not, in the UK. There's right. not. There's not. Right. There's no constitutional right to freedom of speech. But They're trying to ban it here. Japan. We're fighting them. Okay, yes. so that book. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that. Sweet poison. How the world's most sweet. popular artificial sweetener is killing us. My story, yep. by Dr. Yeah. Janet Hull, and you've also written Splenda. Is it safe mm -hmm. or not? As mm -hmm. well as you have a, uh, you've written a book on cancer prevention, prevention diet, Richardson's cancer prevention diet. We won't have time to talk about that today. Uh, we'd like to, and I may, we may segue into that right at the end. But so you've written two really definitive works on one aspartame and one on Splenda. Aspartame, by the way, folks, is is a name for the sweetener that contains primarily three uh, chemicals, one phenylalanine, which is an amino acid. It's not an essential amino acid. Aspartame, which is also an amino acid, aspartic acid, and methanol. And these break down uh, the aspartame and the methanol then. Aspartame will break down into methanol. Methanol then breaks down into formaldehyde. And what in the world do we use formaldehyde for? We give it to people yeah. when they're... When they've let, uh, when they've, we give it to the faithfully departed. We embalm them in formaldehyde. So when you when you take talk talk to us about aspartame and talk to us about the effects of formaldehyde, uh, what what a adverse effect that has on your health. Well, you know, Dr. John Olney was saying that uh, he discovered that when you isolate the amino acids and you use them to control a drug or a medicine that they, be, they turn toxic and their toxicity, um, he, he believes that the phenylalanine was what was causing the lesions in the brains of his laboratory mice. The aspartic acid was causing hyperactivity. And of course we know that the methanol is for embalming fluid. So I suppose you could say maybe my thyroid was being embalmed <laughs> because you know the thyroid gland is going to absorb all of that. Right. But what's interesting is that G.D. Serrell um, first discovered aspartame as an ulcer medication. Back in 1965, they were doing research for a new ulcer drug, and as it always seems to happen, he dropped his papers on the floor 
and licked his fingers to get the papers up and go through them to make sure they were in order and realized his fingers were sweet. So they just put two and two together. They had already applied for the FDA approval for a new drug. All they did was switch the paperwork as a food additive. So in essence, and what we used to ring the bell about back in the early 90s, well, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s with aspartame was that this is an ulcer medication. That's all it was discovered for. When it lost its patent, it was free game. So the Chinese have been producing uh, aspartame. They're the largest producer of aspartame in the United States are in the world, but they do make a form in Germany. We do manufacture some in the United States. But uh, what they've done now to re-up their patent is all they've, they've just added a fourth ingredient to that mix and then they repatented it. So, is that cereal, and they lifted, the cereal corporation? Uh, uh, Monsanto. Monsanto is the producer. Yeah, the, and what do they have in their aspartame now? The fourth ingredient is another, it's a third amino acid. So they just piggybacked another amino acid on it just to just to rename it. And did and they have to go it. through a drug approval or a, 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 some form of a FDA approval for that? Their form, right. They went through whatever routine they do to push it through, you know. But they've renamed it uh, Neotame. And one thing that's interesting about this is they lifted the FDA warning for fetal kininurics for PKU. So when neotame is added into a product now, it doesn't have to be labeled sugar-free, and it does not have to carry the PKU warning. Why does it have to be labeled sugar-free? Well, you, you know, I was um, emailing with Jennifer uh, Johnson the other day, and what happened to Jennifer happens to so many people. They are getting protein bars. They're getting chewing gum at the checkout at the grocery store. They're purchasing ice creams and uh, protein powders that they would never ever assume had artificial sweeteners in them. And nowhere on this packaging does it say contains artificial sweeteners or sugar-free. It's not even a fat-free or low-fat. You know, they should be saying sugar-free or low sugar, maybe. Be but it had three different types, this protein bar, she was exposed to, I believe, had three different types of artificial sweeteners, and one was sucralose. And she was having horrible reactions to this until she finally realized, oh my gosh, I'm getting into sucralose, which is Splenda. So she was having reactions to it, and I believe people are having reactions to these products completely unaware that they are exposed to them and that they're getting into them. And they don't have enough information in order to go back and track it and follow it down. Yeah, so like switching I did. The, they're switching the names around. So is Neotame something that people could see on a label that would clue them in as well, not just sucralose? It's not labeled very much. It's really actually hard to find a product that has the Neotame label on it, but it's in there. And that's the thing that's so hard as a researcher to nail down because. They'll have aspartame, they'll have sucralose, they'll have ACE-K, saccharin, stevia is, is being added. They're all being added to the same products. So everybody's got a little tiny piece of the pie. Everybody's making a little bit of money and they're piling all of these different chemicals together so that they all react in different ways with different people, plus they react with one another but it's very unusual to find the label Neotame. When it first came out, I could find it. Now I'm having a very difficult time finding Neotame labeled on anything. Listen, I'm going to if run. It's less than 2%, if it's less than 2%, they don't have to put it on there at all. Let's just run down a list right here of, of where what products, food products that would contain or could contain aspartame. Of course, the diet soda waters, uh, sweetener packets that you have at the restaurants, Breakfast cereal oftentimes will have these uh, artificial sweeteners in it. Gum, of course, many of the candies, gelatin, granola bars, protein bars. And you're telling me in the protein bars, they don't say that aspartame's in it? No. Huh? No, they do not. They do not. They do not say there's no PKU warning on it. There's no uh, artificial sweetener added to it warning label at all. 
you have to go through and you know a protein bar the ingredient label is tiny right you have to go through and eat it all four four different artificial sweeteners were in that one protein bar uh, Dude, guess pudding low-fat yogurt fruit cups and uh, some over-the-counter medications so syrups and and syrups of course Let's see if we have yeah. a li- list, and, and, and of course, the sucralose can be in any of these products as well, uh, and they may be combined, but usually they're not. They use one or the other. So b- both these products are artificial. That means they don't exist in this combination in nature. Now, they might argue on the one side, you, those that, that promote and sell a spark team, and I've read the articles about that. They go, well, these, these occur in nature for crying out loud. I mean, uh, phenylalanine and aspartic, aspartame, they're just amino acids, so that's fine. But it, it, uh, they do contain methanol, and if I'm not incorrect, that aspartame can be converted to methanol as well, can it? Well, the methanol will break free at 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and so down here in Texas, as you well know, you're right. going to get that in the... In the, uh, and then uh, the that transport methanol truck. gets converted to formaldehyde. Into the formic acid and the formaldehyde. Right. That's correct. So you've got this you've got this abundance of an isolated phenylalanine and an isolated aspartic acid. And the aspartic acid is probably what's going to affect the eyes and the retina more than anything. The phenylalanine, again, Dr. John Olney had proven that that's what ate the holes in the brain mass of his laboratory mice. And then you've got that they're bonded together by the methanol, free methanol, white lightning, rock gut alcohol. And once that is released, then that again, it, you know, will metabolize into formic acid and formaldehyde. Something interesting, people that are drug addicts or alcoholics, they're addicted to aspartame because of its, its, its methanol. So the body is getting that signal it's getting it, it, it it's it's getting hit with okay there's you're not drinking a whole lot but we got a little bit of methanol in here so alcoholics have a tendency to drink 2 to 4 liters of diet drinks a day wow and chew the gum and they are addicted to it so people need to really watch out for that if they have addictive tendencies and drug addictions could be thrown into that as well just because it triggers that that memory in the brain Sucralose is a is sucrose with a chlorinated it's, it's a chlorinated hydrocarbon. They've they've added chlorine to the sucrose. Sucrose is a sugar molecule. It's broken down in the body into glucose. So it's a natural sugar. They took a natural sugar sucrose and they bound to it chlorine. Who made who makes sucralose? What was interesting is ma- the who, who information. Ma- who- who makes it? Well, what, Tate what? And Lyle, well, Tate and Lyle uh, discovered, the sugar company in the UK discovered sucralose, and they yeah. went after it. They were looking for a competitor to aspartame. So this wasn't accidental at all. Um, Johnson & Johnson markets it as um, Splenda. So they bought the rights to market it as Splenda. So um, McNeil um, Nutritionals, is a subsidiary of of Johnson and Johnson, okay. and I believe I'm correct on that. Golly gee, Ugh. Um, so well, what we're looking at? Well, anyway, what sorry? we've got here, you've got a chlorinated hydrocarbon, and chlorinated hydrocarbons are carcinogenic. Why in the world? They literally removed three quarters of that of that sugar molecule and inserted chlorine. But in order, it's in Splenda, is it safe or not? It's in the book. Because of my work with, with the aspartame and the NutraSweet industry, all of the researchers that were working on whether um, sucralose was safe or not, they sent me all of the original work. So I have the original research studies from Tate and Lyle. And in there, in order to get that chlorine to lock in and stay, because you know chlorine just combines with anything. Right. And so in order to get it to stay in there with that one quarter sugar atom, they had to insert lithium chloride, met, uh, uh, they, they in, inserted ethanol and methanol, they inserted acetone. I mean, they used all kinds of crazy solvents 
to get that chlorine to stay locked in. And they claimed that it did not digest. But the Japanese did some super studies proving that at least 15% of that chlorine does digest. It will break free when you ingest it. Hence, you're going to have GI problems, IBS, bladder infections, kidney infections. You're going to have every health symptom that's going to mock drinking chlorine. And that's what happens when you, can, when you ingest Splenda. And it caused the laboratory mice to have paralysis in their hind legs, and it lowered fertility rates. Well. Nasty stuff, huh? Well, so, folks, what we're talking about here is the dangerous, adverse, deleterious side effects of these artificial sweeteners. You know, we used to have cyclamates in the old days. I don't even. I think they took those off the market. They were proven to increase the risk of cancer, and some of the. What What were the other uh, artificial sugar? Well, I cyclamates? will tell you, uh, A sulfame K, ACE K, has been proven to cause cancer. But the history of saccharin is interesting. When I was doing my research on NutraSweet and Equal. Because the Monsanto Chemical Company owned the original patent for saccharin, all of this information about saccharin was coming up for me. Now, a lot of this information is really hard to find now, so I've got it all saved in lots of different places. But saccharin never caused cancer, never. That was a marketing ploy. Monsanto used it, you know, it, their first customer was the Coca Cola Company in 1902. So the original Coca-Cola had saccharin, but they never were able to get Fresca and Tab and any of the diet drinks off and going in the 1950s and 60s when they were trying to market that. So they knew that saccharin wasn't really doing much, had a bitter taste, and it just wasn't very popular. So when G.D. Serrell discovered NutraSweet Equal or aspartame, uh, the Monsanto Chemical Company worked on them for quite a while to purchase that patent, and then they purchased G.D. Serrell. So when they did that, they formed the NutraSweet Company. They did this massive marketing campaign, pushed it through the FDA in, in the early 1970s, and then that was immediately rescinded because Dr. John Olney and several other research scientists went to Congress and said, no, 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 no. This stuff is not to be put on the market. It's toxic. So they left saccharin available for the 10-year period from the 70s to 1981-82 while they were building the Duke Research Center, while they were buying their research scientists, and while they were buying their politicians. They left saccharin safe until they finally got aspartame approved the second time in the 80s. Then they slapped the cancer warning on saccharin, but at that time, they agreed to take the cancer warning off in 2001. The whole thing was a marketing setup, and it was very well organized and structured. So saccharin never did cause cancer, never did. That was cyclamate they used in that study. And they lifted the cancer warning in 2002. It took them an extra year. Saccharin in my opinion, is perfectly safe. If a diabetic or if someone who is stubborn and is going to not listen to us, if they're going to pick a pink, yellow, or blue packet, I always recommend to them to pick the pink because it doesn't spike your blood sugar if you're diabetic. It doesn't cause um, cancer. That totally bogus. So Isn't that interesting? Right. That, so the pink, the, the pink artificial sweetener is what in the pink package? That's exactly. correct. Yep, that's yeah, but correct. What's the name of it? What's the trade name? Oh, Sweet and Low. Low. Sweet and Low. Low. Mm -hmm. okay. But see, what's interesting is Monsanto owned the patent on both aspartame, NutraSweet Equal, saccharin, and Sweet and Low. They owned that. They they owned both of the patents for decades. Isn't that okay? Tell me about stevia. Tell me about stevia, natural sweetener stevia, and erythritol. Okay. I call all of the atolls, maltitol, mannitol, sorbitol, erythritol, um, those, those are gray area sweeteners, in my opinion. They are sort of like your corn syrup, or like you had said, they were trying to market aspartame as being originally natural because right. it comes from amino acids. 
it's 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 manufactured but yet it doesn't have a whole bunch of toxic chemicals added to it in order to lock it in and get it to digest slowly and all that but the sugar alcohols are so potent they've been extracted from their their fruit or vegetable sources they have been altered in the lab they have been manufactured slightly um, and so by the time you ingest them, they are so potent and so strong. They will spike blood sugar. They will cause IBS, lots of stomach aches, um, nausea, diarrhea. So if you're chewing, it's a better choice for your gums, but you have for chewing gums, but you have to be very, very careful. If your child is chewing gum, for example, and then complains of a tummy ache, he's telling you he's got a stomach ache from the, from the fruit uh, alcohols that were in that gum, from the erythritol or the Zorbitol. So it can cause stomach cramping. So that's a real deal. Um, it's, so that's why it's a gray area to me. And I tell people, what about just watch it. What about stevia? Stevia is fabulous. If you've traveled to Central America, you know that they have used that in Uruguay and Paraguay for over 1,500 years. It's no different than chewing a basil leaf or an oregano leaf or a rosemary leaf. It's a natural plant. It's a natural leaf that grows in the rainforests there, and it's extremely sweet. And people have been chewing that for gum health. It actually helps with, with gum and dental issues. Could you imagine if we put that in toothpaste? So when that was brought into the United States back in the 80s, the FDA shut every attempt to bring it in down. And do you remember Oscar um, with the Stavita company in Arlington, Texas? No. Do you remember that no. history? No, I don't. He was, he was the one that brought Stevia in originally in the United States. Well, I was there when they FDA raided his warehouses. They confiscated all of his Stevia and they literally burned all of his Stevia cookbooks. It was it was surreal. It was absolutely surreal. So it's taken a very long time for stevia to make its way onto the American market, but that's what they use in Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, all over the Far East. They've used stevia for decades. They use it in Europe. They use it, of course, in South America. So stevia is a very natural, a very safe, a very healthy sweetener, like anything else. You don't want to overdo, don't use too much, don't use it for too long throughout the day, and always make sure to get a pure form. There's a form, I don't know if I should say their name or not, but uh, it starts with a T, where they're marketing stevia. That's a little bit stevia and a whole lot of other stuff, a lot of preservatives in that. They've To make profits, they've stretched out that stevia so it's very little in that product. What you want to do is go to pure stevia manufacturers. It's fine in the powdered form, in the leaf form, and in the tablet form. There's a liquid. So stevia is wonderful. We've got a liquid form we carry here at Hotsi Vitamins. A liquid form. Yep. So you're going to get it in dropper. One drop is equal to a, is equivalent to a teaspoon yep, yep. of sugar. It's, so we use stevia and highly recommend that for the reasons that Dr. Hull has uh, uh, explained. Because it's natural, it's safe. And it has no mm -hmm. unnatural chemicals in it. And so we highly recommend using Stevia extract. You can get it in a powder form. Uh, you can get it in a, in, um, in a dropper form. You know, either way, get it in packages or in a little bottle. And you'll find that satisfy any your, your sugar desires and your sugar cravings. Now, let's, let's go back and just summarize this. First, people eliminate sugar, which is good. Sugar can be very bad for you. Uh, we're talking about, you know, sucrose, glucose, fructose. Too much sugar, your body ends up burning sugar in your mitochondria. It's a very inefficient way to burn. It burns up quickly. You find yourself frequently getting sugar highs, sugar lows, constantly hungry. So people want to not eat not only sugar, but all the simple carbohydrates, the pizza, pasta, bread, cookies, cakes, cereals, all these things are made of grain products. Grain products are simply... Uh, starches and starches are simply sugar molecules hooked together. So as soon as you put them in your body, you begin to break them down and you get elevated sugar levels. And so when, when uh, our government has is their healthy diet, the FDA promotes and the health department promotes, they say, eat a lot of grains. 
and then a little greens, and then a little less meat and a little bit of fat. Well, we'd say that that pyramid's upside down. So we would recommend right. more of a ketogenic, ketogenic eating program, burn fat right. rather than burn sugar. Now, does it mean you should never, ever have a piece of bread or, or never have any dessert at all? No, you can, but you got to get down to your right body weight, and you've got to go get on a ketogenic eating program. Sugar's ca- sugar causes inflammation in the body. So people say, well, sugar's not good for you. It gives me, you know, diabetes and all that, so I'm going to take these artificial sweeteners. Well, the artificial sweeteners, you know, it's, it's, it's like going from uh, the, the, the pot into the fire, you know, the, the frying pan into the fire. You, you're getting worse problems. Now you're getting all the chemical problems that are associated with it. So you're just exchanging one series of adverse problems for another. And so what we would recommend is that just go natural. How hard is this to figure out? You know, why should I put something unnatural into my body in an unnatural form? Why don't I just use stevia? And that's what we recommend, and I've used that for years. And that will control, you know, if you've got diabetes, you can take that. and You can make all kinds of great cakes. You can make, you can make ice cream with stevia. Stevia is just a great mm-hmm. sugar substitute that's natural, and it's healthy, and it's not going to cause you these severe and serious side effects that you get from taking aspartame and from taking Splenda or sucralose. So, Dr. Hull, I want to congratulate you on the outstanding you know, research work you've done to expose. And I haven't read your books, but I've known about this you know, for years, and we've always... In fact, I heard Splenda at one time, and I saw I mentioned in one of your articles here that Splenda at one time had been used as an insecticide to kill ants. When the ants well, well, that was the aspartame. That was the aspartame. Was that the aspartame that was that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, yep. if you can put you can put a diet cola can and see we're in Texas, right? So you can set outside in the sunshine a regular Coca-Cola can and a Diet Coca-Cola can. The ants will not touch the Diet Coca-Cola can. They'll be all over the regular one. They that won't ought, go to it. That ought to tell you something right there, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Just look at nature with God's nature. It'll tell you what's good for you and what's bad for you. Dr. Hull, thank you I so much. I have a question. Can I ask sure. you a quick question? Sure. One thing that I've always wondered about. When people go to the doctor, because they're going to have all kinds of different reactions to these artificial sweeteners, again, it's going to go where their weak link is, right? It's going to affect their eyes or maybe their hormones or maybe their skin or their blood pressure. When they go to the doctor and they have these health symptoms, what I see out of the, the, the clients that I work with and counsel, the, the, the doctors will not find anything. And this happened to me except for my T3 and T4. There were no no symptoms, you know, on blood tests and stuff. Typically, people don't, the doctors don't see anything. Right. So they send them home with this big question mark on, well, we don't know what's going on, but here's this prescription. They never once ask them if they're using aspartame, sucralose, or, you know, they'll ask them if they're on medicines. Right. But they never ask them if they're on aspartame. What can we do to encourage doctors to just ask that question because when they remove the aspartame nine out of ten of their health symptoms are going to go away i think that's a very that is very very good point you make and i don't know why doctors don't do that and i know that we've all we encourage people get off you know uh, you know if it's in a can package or box just don't use it and i ought to and we talk but this is really the first podcast i've done on the artificial sweeteners although we don't use artificial sweeteners and we promote stevia but we, we, right, right. we ourselves, and we're, you know, big into natural approaches to health. That's why we got you on the program today, because we need to be more proactive with all our guests. And, uh, and in this podcast, um, what I want our, our, our guests and our listeners to do, hey, folks, as uh, Bob Newhart says, and go watch it on YouTube, Bob Newhart, it's entitled Stop It. Here's what Bob New, New, Newhart would say. If you're having all these symptoms and you're using all these artificial, your drinks with artificial sweeteners in it, Bob Newhart would say, what I want you to do is hear two words, just two words. And no, you don't need to write it down. You ought to be able to remember two words. And here's what Bob Newhart would say. And this is what I would say. If you're taking, if you're having a host of 
adverse medical symptoms that your doctor goes, you know, I don't know what in the world is going on here. I think we're just going to give you an antidepressant because you're a depressed person. Well, if they tell you that, but here's what I want you to do. If you're drinking all these artificial drinks and getting all these uh, artificial sweeteners in your body, two words. You ready? Stop it! Just stop it. (laughs) No, you don't need to write it down. Oh, you're wondering if I mean stop it. Yes, I mean stop it. It's funny. People often ask me, what do you mean by stop it? It's really not rocket science. S-T-O-P, stop it, I-T. Quit doing it. Stop it. That's all you have to do. If you want to be healthy and well, sometimes you've got to do a 180 and go in the exact opposite direction you're going. So if you're using these artificial sweeteners, stop it. And Dr. Hull. And expect withdrawal symptoms, too, because it's very addictive. That's very true. So, Dr. Hull, your information today was both fascinating and terrifying. I'm sure people want to learn more about you, how they can find you. Is that JanetHull.com? It is, Stacy, and thank you very much. Yeah, so so J-A-N-E-T-H-U-L-L.com and then Sweet poison.com uh-huh that's where they can find uh-huh. out more about one of your books right i've got several different websites because as dr hosey was saying i've worked with you know the the cancer doctors that were in the 1930s you know i've published their information i've got lots of different stuff going on but janethull.com is my mothership my landing page Perfect. and they can just find me find me everywhere from there we'll spider web web out from that one. Janet, I just want to congratulate you on the outstanding work you've done. You haven't quit. You've kept up the fight. And just talking to you today just reignites uh, my interest in this whole topic of artificial sweeteners to make sure that with our guests here that we make sure that they know, like, even when we recommend stevia, that means they need to be stopping all these artificial uh, sweeteners that they're taking in their diets and in their drinks. So thank you so much for for your hard work, and we appreciate you, and congratulations on your success. Yes, thank you, Dr. Hull. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure talking to somebody with a similar accent. (laughs) (laughs) Well, God bless you. Thank each one of you all for listening to Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution. And as a reminder to all of our listeners, we do offer stevia, the pure stevia that Dr. Hull talked about. All you have to do is go to hotzevitamins.com. That's H-O-T-Z-E vitamins.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-579-6545. That's 1-800-579-6545. Always a pleasure having you join us here at Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution. Information provided on this radio program is neither intended nor implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice and is not intended to replace the services of a physician, nor does it constitute a doctor-patient relationship. You should not use information from this radio program to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without consulting with a qualified health care provider. If you have or suspect you have an urgent medical problem, promptly contact a professional health care provider or call 911. Dr. Hotze's Wellness Revolution radio program advises you to always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider prior to starting any new treatment or with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Any application of the recommendations from this radio program is at the listener's discretion.